Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. What's up, Lance? Oh, what is going on? I mean, the sun's shining. It's a little chilly here, but I can feel spring around the corner. And with spring comes some good conspiracy theories. <laughs> it sure does. Dr. Lee Meller's new book, Conspiracies Uncovered, is now out. And you should pick it up. It's really good. It really kind of goes through them in chronological order. And it's it's interesting, Lance. And this conversation with Lee is great. It's compelling. We go through a lot of them. And he's so knowledgeable on the subject. What I really like about it, and I think I mentioned it to him in the interview, is that there's so much history to it. And it's factual. He's not saying this exactly happened. He's giving you the elements that surrounded this particular incident and how that could relate to the next one down the line in more of a linear fashion and in a linear sense. We talked about Robert Kennedy's assassination. We talked about MK Ultra, the hippie culture, and how all of those might be connected in some way. He's super, super fascinating when he's talking about this. And they actually surprisingly left out a couple of chapters. He could have gone on and on with more of these conspiracy theories or conspiracies uncovered. That's right. And he's releasing some content on his podcast, Murder Was the Case, which, of course, Lance is on the Crawl Space Media Podcast Network. But he's releasing some of those chapters on his podcast. Uh, so if you read the book, it would really be a, a complete book if you were to listen to those chapters that were cut. So make sure to check out his podcast and follow Dr. Lee Meller on Twitter at Dr. Underscore Meller. There are links in the show notes. Be sure to check out all of our fine shows at MissingCSM.com or CrawlSpace-Media.com. Dr. Lee Meller, welcome back to the airwaves. How are you today? Got a doctorate, got a new book, got a pirate hat. Feeling pretty cool, actually. How are you, Tim? <laughs> I am doing great. I was wondering, you were holding up your book, and that which is awesome, your book, Conspiracies, oh, you can't quite see here, Conspiracies Uncovered, your new book, um, and your other hand, you were, for those of you who aren't watching the video, you were you had your index finger up on your other hand at, for, at the first glance. I thought you were giving us the finger like <laughs> F you. I have a book. And then I'm like, no, that's his index finger. And then I thought you meant to, you were saying like it reached number one on like the New York times bestseller list or something, but you're pointing to something even cooler. You were pointing to your doctorate, which is right above your shoulder there. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's just a coincidence, by the way, this was a room that was free in the place where I'm staying right now. But when I set up my computer, I was like, oh, look at that in the background. Okay. So uh, what, what did you nice. call that, Lance? Humble brag? <laughs> I've never used uh, the term humble brag. He did. It's he a good did. one, though. Uh, I'll use it. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? How are, how are you? You were trapped overseas. Are you still trapped? I'm trapped, but one could argue that I fell upwards. So that's a term I coined for when things fuck up for you and then it turns out to be for the best. So where I came from Canada, I, there were no direct flights to Portugal. I'm looking for a house on the continent. You can get some beautiful rural properties out there. And I want to build like a giant studio and palace. You guys, of course, are invited to come stay, hang out. We'll have like video cameras, all kinds of stuff going on there. But there were no direct flights from Canada to Portugal because of the pandemic. So and I said, okay, I'll go to England. I'll stop there for 10 days. I have my mandatory quarantine and then I'll go from England to Portugal. And during that time, that new strain emerged and everything went into lockdown. And then I was just like, of course, <laughs> of course this would happen to me. Uh, like, why would I ever catch a goddamn break? And then it turns out that Canada is something like 48th in the world now as far as progress on the vaccines in the UK is like number three. So I'm looking at that through my optimism goggles going, well, I'm going to be vaccinated a lot more quickly being stuck here. Well, that's a good thing. Unless, of course, you're an anti-vaxxer like, uh, you know, some conspiracy theorists who, uh, who you may have written about in your new book, Conspiracies Uncovered. <laughs> I didn't actually get into the anti-vaxxing. I mean, I mean, the thing with the conspiracies is there's so many to 
pick from. I had to do some mix mashes. Like I have one on weather control, the HARP facility in Alaska and how it shoots beams into the ionosphere and causes sky quakes and Hurricane Katrina was triggered by that and, and such. But then I use that also to sneak in chemtrails because I couldn't have a chapter on each because there's only a finite amount of time in the book. So, uh, yeah, I didn't get around to anti-vaxxers. I mean, that's just a whole, that's a whole book in itself. For 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 sure. Yeah, the anti-vaxxer thing, I'm, it's surprising you don't have it in here, but you're right. This book would be like triple the, the length. Um, you cover so many conspiracies here. Before we get into some of your favorite ones, how did you even go through the process of narrowing them down to fit in a book um, that was so consumable in size? Well, they give me the page count, the publisher, and then they said, you know, we have this list of conspiracies that you might want to work with, but we'll go back and forth and see which cases they have. And the publisher is based in the UK. And so they had some very quaint little British conspiracies. And I looked at them and I'm like, you know, these are charming. I get it. And if I was writing an encyclopedia of conspiracy theories, I would certainly include these. And gents, do not take offense. But when it comes to conspiracy theories, we're going to full out American because if you want to go to like the absolute most batshit crazy for baby like Patrick Swayze conspiracy theories, you have to start in the US of A. And they were very easily persuaded when I sent them the list back. A lot of them actually had no clue about some of the more modern ones in the book, like uh, the death of Seth Rich. I think even a lot of Americans are not quite as acquainted with that one as they should be a lot of the things surrounding Jeffrey Epstein and yeah. So I kind of steered it in that direction. I was, I was also looking for something that could be a thread that goes through everything or at least a great deal of the book. And that is Nazi escapees at the end of the second world war. So you have obviously Operation Paperclip, where Nazis are usually of some sort of intellectual or scientific importance, are brought over to the United States clandestinely and are used in the Cold War. So you have like Werner von Braun, the famous rocketeer, you know, he's used in the space race. And the Soviets were doing the same thing. And it's I, I managed to meld that into a chapter about how the Catholic church, and this is where it gets into like, to what extent members of the Catholic church certainly smuggled out hundreds of Nazi war criminals to South America. And they had this very Byzantine, but obvious network in retrospect to do so. But you kind of start the book with that conspiracy. Juan, did they get Hitler out? It's not as cut and dry as you might think. There's actually a chance, I think, that they did, unless I missed something huge. Still, I think probably less likely. But I tried to frame it in that way, where it's like, okay, so did Hitler get out? That's one chapter. How did he get out? Well, we know he got out through these complicit members of the Catholic church, but did the Pope know how, what was it? Was it the Catholic church as an institution or was it rogue members of the Catholic church? That's kind of the conspiracy theory there, but then to end with, but Oh, by the way, operation paperclip, a bunch of them got out to the United States too, including people that really should have hanged at Nuremberg. And that segues great into things like area 51 and even last you know, to some point into like the Kennedy assassination. And um, also there's Nazi remnants in the MK Ultra mind control programs and everything. So what I tried to do is always have a thread from a previous conspiracy theory tying into subsequent chapters, because that in itself is sort of the spirit of 
conspiracy theories, right, is forming connections. And sometimes they truly are there. And sometimes they're just like, well, it could be true. Well, I feel attacked. I, I feel personally <laughs> attacked about everything you just said. As a flat earther. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was merciless yeah. on them. Which, <laughs> rightfully so. Okay, but, but let me put it like this. When it comes to was the moon landing fake, there's a bit of research you have to do to debunk some of the claims. Like, why does the moon look so bright? Why does it look like a soundstage? I didn't know the answer to that, but it didn't take me a long time to find the answer to that. Uh, other things like, do the ballistics make sense in the JFK assassination or the RFK assassination? Well, I'm not a ballistics expert. Like, there are people who specialize in doing this for a living, so I should really consult them. With the flat earth theory, <laughs> I just sat in my backyard for five minutes and thought, and that's how I debunked it, just simply thinking. So to to break down the title of your book, Conspiracies Uncovered, I often have a bit of an issue defining um, or coming up with the difference between uncovering a conspiracy and debunking a conspiracy. Because you can debunk, I guess, a conspiracy theory, but if you are uncovering a conspiracy, did you look into these circumstances and actually uncover a conspiracy? Like, let's say... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess my question is, what did you expect when you went into it? Did Were you going in completely open-minded and I'm going to uncover these conspiracy theories or I'm going to debunk them? Um, because I think a lot of people just when they hear conspiracy theory, they automatically go to, it's not real. It's made up. It's, it's a conspiracy, but the, the, the word conspiracy exists. You know, there are conspiracies. Oh yeah. They're happening right now. They're oh, going yeah. on all the time, all the time. This interview is a conspiracy. <laughs> I don't even think it's happening. If it is, I'm not in on it. Or am I a double agent? <laughs> what is the name on that doctorate? <laughs> <laughs> Triple agent. Yeah. So like Ghislaine Maxwell's dad, but we won't get into that right now. <laughs> so the question is conspiracies uncovered. And so like, did I personally uncover them? No, other people have uncovered them. And I went to those and I checked out and like, yes, legit. The documents are there. The government has admitted to it but still for some reason large remnants of the population do not realize that it happened or don't seem to acknowledge the implications that something like that happens so let's say one of the actual conspiracies that was uncovered and is arguably one of the best chapters in the book was the cia mind control program mk ultra i mean that 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 is so absolutely fascinating but then once you have establish that conspiracy and you know who is working with mk ultra then it starts to move into the speculative right so you can have a conspiracy that's confirmed but what that conspiracy managed to achieve and got their fingers into can then veer into conspiracy theory territory a conspiracy theory or conspiracism of course is when you don't really have enough evidence to meet the standard of being able to say, yes, this is factually validated as a conspiracy. And, you know, some of them can be kind of tame. Like, I don't think that people who think there were two shooters at Dealey Plaza are completely off their rocker. And then you can juxtapose that with, like, the flat earth theory people, right? Or you, you can have the people who think there were two shooters at Dealey Plaza and that involved the mafia, the CIA, the, the <laughs> um, aliens, <laughs> like all that, the, the, the lizard people. So even the conspiracy theories, there's, um, there's levels of believability and, and plausibility. Like I, I will definitely have time for someone that wants to sit down and, and give something that they can't prove, but they that they suspect um, that is within reason. But some people just buy into everything, and that's one of the thing I know. I notice you guys know that I study 
uh, sexual homicide and paraphilias like fetishes. And one of the things I always say to cops when I'm training them, I said the thing with paraphilias or, you know, fetishes is they're like cockroaches. You might see one, but there's actually probably like 10. For some reason, people with paraphilia tend to have more than one. And I noticed that about uh, conspiracists, I, you know, how your hardcore conspiracists, they don't just believe that the moon landing is fake. They also believe that JFK was killed and that Area 51 has aliens and that all three things are somehow linked with, you know, a big dollop of Epstein didn't kill himself in the middle, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. Okay. So slow down here, Lee. This is getting out of control. Um, we've talked about a lot of conspiracies already. Can you just tell us real quick about MK Ultra? Because I do agree. I think that's one of the most fascinating chapters. And um, as you noted and, and wrote in the book, there's a lot of evidence backing this up, a lot of documents that were declassified backing this up. So, yeah, can you explain a little bit about what MK Ultra is? Right. So, even before the Cold War began, the Nazis were looking into ways to control people's minds. So there are some roots in it there, but that's a very long story. I won't start at that point. When the Cold War began, communism was viewed by the American intelligence agencies as essentially like a type of mind control, a zombification. And that in order to combat this, you had to understand how it worked. And around this time, also, it, during the 40s, LSD had been accidentally invented in Switzerland by this guy, Albert Hoffman. So you have this happy coincidence going on there. There are people pushing, hey, we really need to see if we can understand people's minds. And... In the CIA, this is under, I guess it would have been, it starts off as the OSS, then becomes the CIA, would have been under Alan Dulles. And it goes from being Project Bluebird, which transforms into Project Artichoke, which then becomes MKUltra in, I think, about 1953. And where you really see this come to bear is during the Korean War, so early 50s. And you have these American pilots that are captured by Chinese or North Korean forces. And they go on the radio and they say, yeah, the Americans had us flying over the Korean peninsula, spraying the whole thing with chemical agents. Now, the American government knew that that wasn't true. So they're saying, well, why are they going on the radio and saying this with such conviction? Why does it, it's not, it doesn't sound like they've got a gun to their head. You know, they're, they seem like they believe it. And so when the war ended, they were trying to figure this out. They're like, there's been something that's been done to their minds. And actually the term brainwash entered the English lexicon at this point. It actually comes from wash brain. It's a, a Chinese word. So it's flipped the other way around, uh, wash brain, brainwash in English. And so that emerged from the Korean War. They hired a psychiatrist called Louis Jolion West to help deprogram these pilots. And he was successful in doing that. So what had happened is there was some mind control going on on the communist side where they had captured these American pilots and whatever they did to them, I'm not quite sure, but they had convinced them that yes, we had sprayed stuff across the Korean peninsula. And so at this point they start to take the mind control thing very seriously. And they appoint this strange man, Sidney Gottlieb, who is this, Jewish guy from New York. I think he's from humble origins. He's got a club foot. He has a lot stacked against him, but he's a chemist and he's got a brilliant mind. And they're looking at the program at this point and they're saying, ah, eh, it's kind of stuck. It's not advancing. Maybe we need to bring in someone fresh. And this Gottlieb guy seems like the man for the job. So they bring him in and they start to then come up with a series of 
of projects, you wouldn't believe how far this spans. One of the things that happens is they start Operation Midnight Climax. And I want to make an erotica film about this once uh, COVID is done. Too late. I've already copywritten that. Well, we can make it together. Ah, continue. (laughs) So if my mind is recalling, and I think it's actually conjuring up the correct name, they get this other guy on board MK Ultra called George Hunter White. And they set up in San Francisco, this apartment and it's got a one-way mirror that, okay. So there's two apartments, a one-way mirror looks from one apartment into the other. And George Hunter White sits in the empty apartment and he, he gazes through and he observes through the one-way mirror. And then what they do is they pay sex workers to bring their clients back to this other place and give them LSD. And then George Hunter White sits there with like a pitcher of martinis, just drinking it and watching them fuck on acid. I guess there was more to it than that. One of the things that they realized is that when you combine LSD and sex, it really loosens men's tongues. So they're thinking to themselves, like, this is better than torture. Like, it turns out that if you just give people acid and get them the fuck, that you get more information out of them than having to torture them. So this was, these were the conclusions that they were drawing at the time. The fun thing is, like, do you honestly believe that they didn't get in on this? Because I should explain that these are parts of the CIA that are unknown to the CIA. So you have the CIA that knows about aspects of the CIA, and then you have other uh, little cells of the CIA, which are more or less hidden from the organization itself, or they're so independent and sort of like, we don't need to know what you're doing that these guys are like, we got all this money. We've got all this LSD. Like, are we really not going to get in on this fun too? We're just going to sit there watching them. <laughs> And wasn't it historically like no oversight to that particular uh, program? Like you said, they they got uh, all this money um, and no one was really checking in on them. So it's kind of hard to believe that they wouldn't get involved in that party like orgy atmosphere. Why in the world would a government agency provide strong drugs and a ton of money and expect anything not weird to happen. Like, they had to expect something weird to happen. Well, at that time, they had no idea about LSD, really. No one had taken it. And, I mean, this is where Good it point. goes next. Maybe what I should do is is move on to how this backfires. Whoa, this backfired? Oh, this backfires big time. Because, remember, this whole idea is to fight communist brainwashing. It's to push back against, let's say, uh, rampant leftism, as, as they would conceive of it so Gottlieb who is an interesting character he decides he's like let me try give me some of the acid I want to see what it's like I need to know and he takes it and then he becomes convinced this is the key to it all this is the key to mind control as LSD (laughs) so then they set up a series of experiments which are run at universities by people who are interested and the effects of different uh, substances on people's brains, namely in this case, LSD. Now, I should at this point put this in. It's not like the CIA writes a check and just sends it to some academics at a university. There's always this mediator that has some kind of inconspicuous name. Uh, I'm just making this up, but like, the Center for Psychological Understanding Advancement or something like that, or an institute for it. And they're really just a CIA front. And so that's how the money uh, gets from the CIA through this innocuous little organization and into the hands of these researchers. So these guys start doing kind of what they do today with students except involving lsd i mean i guess they're still doing it somewhat because they were doing cocaine studies when i was in school but where they would 
pay students or give them credit of some kind to come on into the lab, take this substance and either do these set of tasks or just let us observe you, whatever. And one of the places that they were doing this was in California, uh, near San Francisco, near Berkeley, all the schools around there. Is, is Stanford there? Yeah, yes. it's up there. Okay. I think it was Stanford. So you have the burgeoning, brilliant author, Ken Casey, who is studying there. And Ken Casey decides that he's going to go in and be, I don't know, make some free money, get some extra credit. Maybe he's just genuinely curious and he's going to try this LSD stuff. Well, so you give it to this exceptional creative mind and he's like, oh man, this is going to change the world. So then they get Allen Ginsberg, the famous beat poet who you know wrote Howl, and he comes in and he tries it and he agrees. And so what happens is Ken Casey and some of his confederates are able to get a hold of all of this acid and they start throwing these giant like everyone take LSD parties, you know, hell's angels are coming to them, all these students. And then they decide what we've got to do is we can collectively alter the consciousness of America. So they buy this bus. This is all documented in the electric Kool-Aid acid test. And they call themselves the merry pranksters. And the bus is driven by Neil Cassidy from Jack Kerouac's on the road. And there, I think there's members of the grateful dead that keep coming and going, but you've got to understand this was before the whole hippie thing. This, this preceded it. And so what they do is they drive all over the United States. I think they, they go uh, down South and then East, you know, and then up and into New York city. And the whole time they're just giving people acid in the form of Kool-Aid and the tie dye shirt is actually invented by accident. I think it was in a, a puddle in Arizona. Someone decided to, Hey, let, let's throw some paint in here and just put this shirt in and it, it came out. So what ultimately happens is in their efforts to combat communism or the spread of radical leftism, through uh, uh, through understanding how to control and manipulate people's minds, they actually turn people on to acid. And Ken Casey and the Merry Pranksters return to San Francisco and kind of are the driving originators that give birth to hippies and the counterculture. And then the CIA has to go into damage control and that part gets fun too. But I've been talking a bit, so... We can pause there for a moment for you gents to comment or ask questions. No, it's a really fascinating um, transition of uh, cultures in in the in American history, at least because you had this image of America being the Leave It to Beaver fifties family unit, and over the course of just a few years, it becomes this Grateful Dead, long hair. You know, the, the hippie culture, the counterculture. Um, and it's a fun factoid to uh, to note that I think Ted Kaczynski and Whitey Bulger both volunteered for this uh, CIA backed <laughs> experiment. Um, some would say that that wasn't a backfire at all. I mean, imagine where we'd be without that experiment. Oh, we'll go there. We'll go into uncharted uh, territory here so let's play a bit having now established mk ultra uh, and how it gives birth to the birth of the counterculture movement before i move on to the most extreme conspiracy theory which i actually think has more credence than people want to believe i do think this is worth mentioning so recall i brought up the psychiatrist louis jolion west he's known as jolly west and he is the guy who deprogrammed all of the pi um, the pilots or the military men who were kidnapped during the Korean War. And so he's MK Ultra. This this isn't uh, by the way, none of this part of it is a, a guess or a rumor. It's confirmed. They were employees. It's in the documents. This all came out 
when the CIA director at the time, Richard Helms, was approached by uh, Nixon, President Nixon, during Watergate. And Nixon said to him, hey, man, you got to help me out here. I'm in a lot of trouble. And Richard Helms is like, no, you're on your own. Like, you're screwed. And Nixon goes, okay, well, you don't get any protection from me. And then Richard Helms goes, oh, shit, all the bad stuff we've been up to and just starts destroying all these documents. Uh, Fortunately, he didn't get to destroy all of them. And there were two separate... uh, I guess you would call them hearings, inquiries that looked into this and, and both found that yes, MK ultra does exist. Here were the employees. So none of this is conjecture. This is a genuine conspiracy, no theory part. Now we're, we're going to start foraying into the parts which are um, suspicious, but let's just say unsubstantiated. So 1964, President Kennedy has been shot in November of the previous year by Lee Harvey Oswald, who was shot two days later by Jack Ruby. So Jack Ruby stands trial and is found guilty. And when Ruby finds out that he's guilty, he gets infuriated with his attorneys and he says, uh, you know, I want different attorneys for my appeals process. I want to appeal this. And there was a guy who was both a lawyer and a mental health professional in the court that his team had used that particularly impressed Jack Ruby. So Ruby's like, I want that guy for my appeals. So this guy comes on and he becomes Jack Ruby's appeals lawyer. And this fellow says to Jack Ruby, he says, well, you know, I think would really help if we assessed your mental health. And Ruby, okay, you know, you're my attorney, whatever you think is best. And so who lands at Dallas Love Field to perform the mental health assessment on Jack Ruby? A innocuous little doctor named Jolly West. And he walks into Jack Ruby's cell to talk to him to perform the mental health evaluation. There's no one else in there. He exits the cell and he announces to the world, ladies and gentlemen, it seems that sometime within the past 72 hours that Mr. Ruby has suffered a complete psychotic break. I can't really do anything for him. He's lost his mind. Now, note this. Before that, no mental health professional had ever noted any kind of psychosis in Jack Ruby. And after that, nobody ever ever didn't notice it. So, man, are you telling me that it's just a coincidence that an MK Ultra psychiatrist walked into Jack Ruby's cell when he'd never been noted as being psychotic before, and then he'd left, and suddenly Jack Ruby was forever more psychotic? Uh, I guess it's just a coincidence, man. That's the conspiracy <laughs> theory part. <laughs> Sounds like a conspiracy fact to me. I mean, it's it's a pretty um, unstable thing to do to to shoot someone, you know, which which is what uh, Ruby did. Yeah, I I thought you were going to RFK's death as a Manchurian candidate because that yeah, one that seemed, yeah, that <laughs> one seemed really uh, like I uh, does J- Jack Ruby one. I I could I could buy it. I could buy it. I one hundred percent buy it. Yeah. But uh, the RFK one, um, I thought was was particularly um, compelling. Let's uh, try and get there chronologically. Okay, let's do it. You won't. Okay, so we've established this character now. He's a suspicious, documented, absolutely one hundred percent. We know that this guy was an MK Ultra uh, employee, Jolly West. So, nineteen sixty four. He walks into Jack Ruby's cell, walks out, suddenly Ruby's a psychotic. Now you have, um, because of the CIA backfire, you've got the hippie movement kicking off in San Francisco. Everyone's having a good time. And who shows up just before the summer of love around hate Asbury and opens up another Operation Midnight Climax type project alan alda well there are rumors that he was involved it could have been a twin a robot clone 
shape-shifting lizards, but it was what they say, okay? It was Dr. Jolly West. And so he shows up there and right in the middle of the counterculture, right at Hate Asbury, and he's got a whole other iteration of Midnight Climax going on. Also, now here's where it gets wild. He has an office at the newly established Hate Asbury Free Medical Clinic. And on the surface, this is just a really good charitable institution because you have all these hippies that are doing drugs that are, you know, having free love and contracting venereal diseases and having bad trips and stuff. And so this noble institution opens up in that area to offer them free uh, medical services. And Jolly West has an office in it. And the guy who establishes it is a, I think he was either a psychologist or a psychiatrist called David Smith. And he's getting funding from the CIA through one of these uh, mediators too. Uh, Tom O'Neill, a journalist who wrote a book recently called Chaos, seems to have established this. And David Smith's interests are in the effects of drugs on people uh, in terms of how, how does it affect them? How does it make them violent? Another guy working there is a criminologist called Roger Smith. So three guys who have offices, Roger Smith, also, uh, sorry, at the Hate Ashbury Free Medical Clinic. Roger Smith is also receiving funding for his interesting research on the effects of drugs on people and how it may lead to violence. So three guys all connected to the CIA, all right in the middle of the counterculture at that, this free medical clinic. And get this, Roger Smith, the criminologist, is Charles Manson's parole officer. Could be a coincidence. Could be. Let's go a little further. Charlie Manson gets out of prison and he's in Los Angeles. He's not allowed. Uh, this is, of course, before all the murders. Charlie was in and out of prison his you know, whole life. He gets out in Los Angeles. One of his parole conditions is you can't leave this area. Well, within two days, Charlie's headed up to San Francisco. Now, this is a repeat offender. He's immediately violated the terms. He should be back in prison almost immediately, but he doesn't. He gets to San Francisco and all of a sudden he's got this new parole officer, Roger Smith, and Roger Smith just, you know, makes a phone call or something and it all just goes away. And this becomes a pattern because Charlie, and this is not do documented in Vince Bogliosi's book, which is really strange, but Charlie, of course, was hanging around Haight-Ashbury at the time and he was building the family and the family and Charlie are always getting into trouble with the law. They are always stealing things there. The family are like the, the women in the family actually are getting underage boys to get into orgies with them and giving them acid. You know, does this sound familiar? <laughs> Uh, no pun intended on the familiar. It, it's a family affair, right? But the uh, the thing is, they get they get caught for this. They get in trouble, and they're brought in. And and you know, Susan Atkins is one of the most prominent and homicidal Manson family members. Uh, she's already in trouble, like Charlie. She's she's already got uh, you know conditions, and they on several occasions are locked up and, and facing criminal charges. And then it's like, just call Roger Smith. And Roger Smith doesn't just get Charlie out of these situations. He gets members of the families out of these situations. At one point, when Charlie is temporarily arrested, Roger Smith is looking after Charlie's kid. Charlie becomes Roger Smith's only uh, client, I guess you would call it. So Roger Smith is the parole officer only of Charles Manson. I will reiterate, 
Roger Smith is receiving funding <laughs> for his experiments on drugs and violence through a CIA mediator. Now, I could keep going, but take this to its logical conclusion. What are the Manson murders? The Manson murders are seemingly senseless, ultra-violent murders committed against strangers by members of the Manson family who are out of their mind on drugs. And so someone asked Tom O'Neill, the guy who researched this, they said, well, was this an MK Ultra experiment gone wrong? Or, or sorry, O'Neill asked an expert on this. He said, was this, okay, an MK Ultra experiment that just went wrong somehow? And this MK Ultra expert replied to Tom O'Neill and said, no, this was an MK Ultra experiment gone right. And we know that. Um, or we can strongly suspect it because if you go back and you look at some of those documents that were salvaged, some of the aims of the things that they wanted to achieve in the MK Ultra program was, hmm, I wonder if it's possible if we can get people to mindlessly kill. That's me paraphrasing. But that's a hell of a lot of coincidences. Wouldn't you agree, guys? Well, also you said uh, that they senselessly killed strangers, those strangers, I mean, famous people. So that was going to make the news. Like Sharon Tate was famous and Polanski, her husband, was famous. And uh, I don't know if it would have had the same effect. It would have had an effect, of course, if it was just your average school teacher and her husband or something. But the fact that they targeted famous people, I don't know, leads me to believe that they wanted the statement to be made. Right, which plays into something which I didn't emphasize enough in the book for spatial reasons, but uh, the CIA was running a program at the time called Project Chaos, all capitals C-H-A-O-S. And uh, the FBI also had a program, COINTEL, which was similar, but it was damage control for the uh, counterculture movement that they'd unleashed. So the whole point of chaos was to make hippies, the whole peace and love, hey, you know, they're gentle people that just want to put an end to the war and they use drugs, but it's just to expand their minds. And uh, they needed to counter that perception that the public had. And what way to, to do it better than to have a bunch of drugged out hippies murder celebrities, as you pointed out, which is going to make the news and then write uh, race war type slogans on the walls. I mean, it makes a bit more sense than the Bugliosi version, doesn't it? It's it actually does uh, yeah. kind of make some weird <laughs> kind of sense, you know. Um, and you're referencing Helter Skelter, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. It's disturbing um, to think that the government could have been up to such, or really was up to such kind of trifling experiments. But um, I don't necessarily think there's uh, government people twirling their mustache it's it's more like this thing got out of hand is that an appropriate read you think well i think at this point we're in conspiracy theory land so mk ultra is a bona fide conspiracy mm -hmm. but when we get into how much if at all charles manson and the family were involved in the mk ultra program then we just get speculative. So that's where I, I become sensible, I think. And this is what made me the right guy to write the book. Uh, I'm open-minded. I'm artistic. I will entertain ideas. I don't shut things down just as a fashion. I, I'm inquisitive. But I'm also logical, and I usually know when to stop. And so that's where I stop. And it's okay to say, I don't know. But I've given you the facts you take them and go with, you know, run with them wherever you want or just go, nah, sounds too convoluted. Yeah, I, I like how you do that in the book, too. You don't really, um, you know, push anything. You kind of, as you say, you let people make up their own minds. And I definitely, I again, I'm going to go back to that RFK one as being one of the most suspicious um, and, and most compelling chapters in the book. 
Um, yeah. I had I had not known a lot of those things. The JFK one struck me as Oswald was very mentally ill, and this isn't so much a conspiracy. But the RFK one uh, is a completely different read to me. Really cool to hear um, someone approach RFK the way you did, because RFK always gets overshadowed by the JFK conspiracies, and RFK is, like Tim said, like there's a lot of stuff in there that a lot of people just don't know, because... He's not as he wasn't a president yet, and and it's not as um, covered in, in such a such great detail. Um, what made you like gravitate to that? Was that part of the, the timeline as well? Yeah, well, these things all flow naturally into one another chronologically. So, I mean, if you go from JFK, you can get to MK Ultra through the Jack Ruby connection with Jolly West, right? And so then you get into the MK Ultra program and you then you can get from MK Ultra into RFK. So it just made sense to sort of, uh, you know, you have appetizers, dinner and, and dessert. They all complement each other. So I tried to write the book in that way. And the 60s lent itself to that very well. So, yeah, the whole Manchurian candidate theory with Sirhan Sirhan. Um, I mean, this is a complex one. What I think the reason is that it doesn't get as much play as the JFK assassination is because Sirhan Sirhan did shoot RFK. That is absolutely undeniable. This wasn't some sniper shot taken from a long distance. He went right up to him and pulled out a gun and, and fired. But there are suspicious elements about it. The reason I initially wanted to put it in, I thought it was really important, was because RFK was never supposed to leave via that route. He was supposed to go downstairs and address people in this other room, but sort of at the last minute, it was like, no, actually, you know, Senator Kennedy, we're going this way. Well, this way just happens to be where for some reason a... Palestinian American is waiting for him with a gun. It's once again, it's an odd coincidence. And so it's, it's often described as a kitchen, but it's more like a, more like a kind of pantry area that they lead him off stage to. And one of the more, let's say skeptical explanations is that there was just so much going on at that time that he got separated from his security and, and some of the other people. But as he's going through this pantry and, you know, he's saying hello to everyone, uh, Sirhan Sirhan, who's in there seemingly waiting for him, but doesn't know that he's coming through to our knowledge. I mean, that's the odd part. Why would Sirhan Sirhan think that he's coming through there? How would he know that? You got this giant hotel. So that in itself always struck me as eh, that was bizarre. And then he sort of leans forward and he he fires at RFK and RFK is killed. But when they ask Sirhan Sirhan about it later, he gives this really interesting story. They say, okay, well, you know, why did you do it? He gives kind of contradictory stories at different points in time, but let's stick to the kind of mystery part of it right now. He says that he doesn't really recall a great period of time between going to this hotel just to have, I, I think he was going to this hotel just to have a few drinks or something like that. And just kind of hang out and he realized that he'd had a little bit too much to drink and that he needed to kind of sober up a bit before he drove home. And then he encountered this woman with a polka dot dress who becomes this mysterious figure that uh, per permeates the whole RFK case. And upon meeting this woman with the polka dot dress, this is sort of where his mind blanks. And he's described by a lot of people who witness him as, as being like kind of robotic, you know, when he kills RFK. And he claims that he only came to his senses 
once so, you know someone had grabbed his arm and slammed it into a nearby uh, table or, or countertop or something like that. Once he was being wrestled, wrestled after the assassination had occurred, it was like all of a sudden he whoo, came back to reality. So if you want to go with the MK Ultra mind control Manchurian candidate angle, you would say, well, it seems that this woman in the polka dot dress may have been an MK Ultra agent and who knows what they'd done. Maybe they implanted something in his mind beforehand that made him go to the hotel. And once he was there, they sent an agent to sort of like flick the switch. And then uh, the, you know, the, the fugue state came on and he, he only awoke after Kennedy was killed. I mean, that would be the conspiracist explanation of it. There's also strange ballistic evidence in the case. There's uh, bullets which seem to do U-turns and come from behind. There's a, a door which has bullet holes in it that would mean that more shots were fired than, than um, Sir Han, Sir Han's handgun had the capacity to fire because they could account for a lot of the, these bullets and holes. But when you, this door was photographed and you can pull that up on the internet and it would, the LAPD just kind of tuck it. And if I recall, it just kind of conveniently went missing and nothing much was done about it. So there's, there's quite a lot of smoke there. And so another aspect I should mention is that one of RFK's security guards that night was actually a Kennedy family hater, an outspoken one. And he was hired from a private security firm. And you can see him right beside RFK in the, you know, one of the canonical photographs of RFK being assassinated. And some of the injuries, like, so Sirhan Sirhan shoots RFK, RFK kind of turns and so I'm <laughs> I'm trying to mix, mix in the skeptical and, and the conspiracist versions of this. So RFK turns, that's important. But when they look at the wounds in RFK, a lot of them seem to have come from behind and angled up through his back. And, and uh, I, I think one was lodged in his neck, one of the bullets. So the shots seem to have come from behind. And, and that's where that anti-Kennedy private security bodyguard would have been. And during the chaos, one could argue that he could have pulled out this gun. Everyone's got their eyes on Sirhan Sirhan, who is firing, and but the kill shots actually come from this other fellow. Now, I can give you the whole skeptics um, debunking of at least some of these things. I think it is definitely worth pointing out that RFK had, I believe in a speech in Oregon, sometime before this, pledge to send more fighter jets to Israel. And of course, Sirhan Sirhan being a Palestinian, uh, and he saw himself as, as one of the uh, marginalized peoples of America that RFK you know, spoke out um, to, to help. So you had like Cesar Chavez and, and the, the sort of migrant labor movement there. You, you had disenfranchised African-Americans. And so RFK was a guy who was speaking out for the underdog. Sirhan Sirhan saw himself like that. And then when RFK gave that speech, Sirhan Sirhan's like, wait a minute, I thought you wanted to help downtrodden people. You're, you wanna send these planes to Israel. I know what they're gonna be used for because I was, I was there. My brother was, was crushed by a tank. And so he at various times has given this as his motive for killing RFK too, which like, if that's it, then I mean, that's fairly clear, but right. Why all these other weird elements? Kind of hard for me to wrap my head around um, somebody getting so angry. And I, I know he used like alcohol as one of the, controlling factors or the uh, triggering factors in his decision to kill uh, Bobby Kennedy. But, I, I, you know, and also it was a different time back then, right? 
I mean, people were very patriotic, whether they were patriotic for this country or the country, you know, they came from. And and if you came from a country where such atrocities happened directly to your family, you know, I can't speak to that. Maybe I would do something like that. Maybe I'd have some drinks, know that this guy was at the um, Ambassador Hotel and and say, you know, maybe I'll just give him a piece of my mind and then have some sort of break. Uh, Maybe. a lot of a lot of elements in play for, you know, <laughs> right. if, if it's a conspiracy, I will say, you know, it's, it sounds compelling. And I remember the, I think the b- ballistics, um, evidence you use in the book really made me wonder. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, it could have all come together, but man, that's a lot of moving pieces. That's the issue. So let's clear some things away that we can easily, you know, dismiss here. So the whole girl in the polka got, polka dot dress theory so there was i can't remember her exact role apologies but there was a latina woman who was sitting outside on the fire escape i believe it was at the time that rfk was killed and she claims that a woman in a polka dot dress and two other guys might have been one doesn't really matter but the woman in a polka dot dress ran down and they said, we did it. We did it. And she said, what? She's like, we killed Kennedy. And so the polka dot dress girl sightings confirmed by that person and then by another male witness. So conspiracy theorists have taken that and they've said, well, look, there's eyewitnesses. Sirhan Sirhan himself said that this happened. So like what this woman, the polka dot dress thing isn't real. Well, it turns out there was some cross-contamination where these two witnesses would have talked before going in to speak with the police. And it's probable that the woman uh, told the man about this and maybe created a false memory. It's really interesting how people's memories work. But, the, for instance, the fire department went... And they looked at the fire escape where she claimed to have been sitting on at that time. And they were able to forensically refute that she had ever been there. So I'm not going to speculate on what her motives were, but you know, a fact's a fact. And and this is the issue with conspiracy theorists is um, sometimes they want to believe in it so bad. They're like, well, the fire department was in on it, man. You know, the, the LAPD was in on it, man. It's, you know, and sort of one of the, I would say the cardinal rules of, conspiracy theories is the more individuals and and agencies in different parts of the world or country that are involved in it the less realistic it's likely to be so with like flat earth theory i told you i sat outside for five minutes and thought of a way of refuting it i realized you would have needed something like hundreds of millions of people if not more to be complicit in this conspiracy theory and that in itself, beyond just the physical elements and the other stupidity around it, makes it fall apart. Um, so I'm inclined to believe that it's more likely that somebody either lied, exaggerated, or thought that they perceived something and, and did so incorrectly than that, you know, the LEPD, the fire department, and all these other elements, the CIA, they were all in on it. It's I, I just don't think that. So girl in the polka dot dress. Uh, it's also been pointed out that polka dot dresses in the sixties, like they, they were in fashion. So there would have been lots of girls in polka dot dresses around. So if other people at the hotel had seen that, uh, yeah, you might've seen a girl in a polka dot dress. It doesn't mean it went down the way that it did. And when, Kennedy was shot in the kitchen. A whole bunch of people come racing out of the kitchen, yelling all kinds of things. Now in that chaos, do you know exactly what it is that you would have heard? You might hear them say something that they didn't actually say, or maybe they said it like, uh, we killed Kennedy. Okay. And you could think, Oh, they, those particular people killed Kennedy, but maybe they're talking about the greater. We like, you know, the American people, we, we did it again. We killed Kennedy. Like what's wrong with us? 
something like that, right? It's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely possible that part didn't happen too, you know, or as you said, wasn't wasn't ever really uttered that way outside. That I could believe. But but it is still strange. Like, um, what we've got to always keep in mind is that Sirhan Sirhan was there with a gun. So his whole story about, oh, I just kind of went there to check it out and have a few drinks. It's like, then why did you bring a loaded gun? Well, it was the 60s. <laughs> How did you it's end America, up America, man. <laughs> How did you end up in the probably one of the least probable areas that RFK would have gone through, right? This sort of kitchen pantry area. How is it that you ended up standing in there? Did you just get so lucky you made a, the like what on paper seems to be the dumbest decision to assassinate him? And then he was sort of led right into your path. And the ballistics is suspicious too. So like with the, with the Manson connection, I actually lean to more towards believing. I, I, I can't prove it, but I find that one pretty convincing. With the Manchurian candidate, uh, Sirhan Sirhan RFK thing, I lean a little bit more towards disbelieving, but I'm not taking either of them completely off the table because there's too many strange occurrences to account for. I got to say, the book is fascinating and um, historical too, which is really cool. Like you, you learn a, a, a bit about history as well as uh, stimulate your, you know, that part of your brain where you, you like to hear about conspiracies and, and exercise those thoughts. So tip of the old cap to you there. I was going to say cowboy hat, but you've got the market on the cowboy I can't. I, I can't wear the cowboy hat with the headphones I've tried. This you got to get a cowboy <laughs> hat with headphones in it. Like, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that sounds real cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's super cool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> maybe maybe I could get some phone guns too. <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> well, Lee Meller, you've done it. You've come on here and you've told us about your book, Conspiracies Uncovered. It's a great book. Go pick it up. Conspiracies Uncovered, Cover-Ups, Hoaxes, and Secret Societies by Dr. Lee Meller. Thank you very much. And check out Murder Was the Case, your fantastic podcast on the Crawl Space Media Network. I should also point out that some chapters were cut at the end of the production line by someone higher up at DK. Maybe that's a conspiracy man, or maybe they just felt it was a prudent decision. I don't know. But one of the ones they cut was on Pizzagate, which bridged my Seth Rich assassination and Epstein chapters rather nicely uh fortunately my publisher dk bucks was uh generous enough to give me sort of give me the chapter back to use as i saw fit so what i did is the last episode of my podcast i just read out the pizzagate chapter so if you buy the book what i would do is i would read up to seth rich then i would i would listen to the episode um, and then I would continue on from Epstein and it even goes all the way up to COVID-19, by the way, and the conspiracies, um, conspiracy theories around that of well, various the other, types. The other conspiracy, um, fact, which I'll say is the one that Tim is actually a Kennedy. They left that one out. They told you to take that one out, um, because of his hair. So, I mean, it was such a short chapter anyway. You said Ted, T Tim Pileri is a Kennedy, and then you showed a picture of his hair, and it's clear that he's a Kennedy. I was surprised that they had you take that one out. 